Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 133, Done with Disney. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my rejuvenated and energetic host, co-host, Michelle Whalen. Are you energetic? <laughs> I don't know about that, but oh. sure, we'll go with that. We had a long holiday. I mean, <laughs> we you, did. You, you've been back to work this week, but right. this is our, our first post-holiday podcast for... Right, but we did year. a podcast last week where we were supposed to... Have done it right. We the were week supposed before, to be off last week. and so really, it's the normal, <laughs> yeah. no, normal for us. So we're actually a day late this week. We were going to do it yesterday, but and I then wasn't. we were just like, <laughs> oh, and I didn't get everything ready either. So right. I was kind of slacker. A slacker. You know what can I tell you? Eh, it Dude, happens. Not enough time in the day. Sometimes we we are the masters of our own universe, so we can. We have the power. We do by the power uh, of grace. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we can decide whenever we want to do our podcast. Yeah, I know. I try to be respectful of our listeners and do it on a schedule. Then. For those who do want to watch us live, live and see the banter, banter live, banter, banter, right? Bantha, bantha. This way, you don't get to see that edited version that's published on right. Mondays. This way, you get to see the raw, unedited, really <laughs> bad audio and all the screw. Up. Well, I don't, I don't edit out any of the screw ups anyway. So yeah, you clean up. I just clean up the audio. Right. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. Today, in our Disney detective, Bob Iger goes back to his roots. And why are so many people saying they're done with Disney, myself included? Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Galactic Star Cruiser reservations are available. But do you really want to book it? Then uh, the on-again, off-again saga of Patty Jenkins' Star Wars movie. I think it's on again. Maybe this week. Probably. Maybe. Possibly. And for our entertainment news, Taylor Swift shows she's a class act, and Vicki Lawrence reveals Betty White's sweet and loving last words. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. But before we do that, though, I do want to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment, you can find video versions of all of our podcasts listed as Insights into Things or on Apple, Spotify, Google, etc., etc., anywhere you can find a podcast. Uh, I would also invite you to uh, write to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. Uh, you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things or links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Sure. Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So decades before he ascended to arguably the highest perch in entertainment as the CEO and executive, uh, the executive chairman of the Walt Disney Company, Bob Iger actually delivered the weather forecast to TV viewers in Ithaca, New York. So before his departure that happened once the new year hit, he had returned to his weatherman roots, appearing on Disney's ABC affiliate, KABC Los Angeles's 6 a.m. news program for an interview and to update viewers with the latest forecast. He said, I've not done the weather in 48 years, but I'll give it a shot. 
um, when he was asked to do so. Uh, you can see there is light rain falling across the Southland this morning, expected to get just a bit heavier as the day progresses. However, this is just a prelude to the big storm that should be coming your way uh, on Monday into Tuesday morning, he had said in opening the forecast. Very nippy on Saturday. Oh, by the way, 62 degrees in the Los Angeles area, he added when he did the seven-day forecast. Uh, and 46 on Saturday. That's when I <laughs> bike ride. <laughs> I thought it was kind of cute. Uh, he said, I think I may have to look out for some early morning frost. So in addition to his weather delivery, where the current meteorologist, uh, Leslie Lopez, had said that he did great, Iger also reflected on his time at the company. He said, I've loved what I've done every day that I've come to work. I've been happy. And that was what I uh, and what he has planned once he leaves. He says, I'm looking forward to what comes next, although I'm not 100% sure what that is. I haven't had a day off since eighth grade. One thing that is probably in the works is another book to follow up on his 2019 memoir, The Ride of a Lifetime. The Hollywood Reporter's Tiana uh, Siegel had first reported that Iger was working on a new book last month, and Iger elaborated on those plans. He said, I'm thinking about it. Right now, it feels like a gigantic, a gigantic homework assignment. But yes, I've been fascinated by how readers led through the um, leader's led through the global pandemic leading through a crisis. There's a gem of an idea there. So kind of interesting that he, you know, had a, a last moment in the spotlight. I'm sure we're still going to hear from him every now and then. But as of, you know, the first of the year, he was officially out of a job with with it's, Disney. So, you know, it's funny. I've criticized him a lot on on this podcast over the past few years. And I've never really to be perfectly honest, cared enough to, to go out and do any research on him. So it kind of shocked me, but it didn't shock me that he started out in as a weatherman because mm -hmm. he kind of strikes you as that type of person when he presents like Disney presentations where it's fluff. Mm. It's not like it's information that you want, but it has to be presented in a way to kind of hold your attention because – you're, you're really just presenting clinical facts as a weatherman. So you have to have some personable manner to you in the way that you present it. Okay. And as he presents things, you know, you see him at, at openings for different park attractions, like when mm -hmm. he did the opening for uh, Galaxy's, uh, Edge. Galaxy's Edge and stuff like that. He has that likable personality to him. Mm -hmm. Um. Something that Bob Traffic, I think, oh, lock, lacks. Definitely in lacks spades. it. Yeah. But he has that weatherman personality. Like, you mm. want to like the guy, you know? Right, he's, right. He's, a, he's a guy, he smiles on camera all the time. And and I think, I think that served him very well. And you wouldn't think that being a weatherman would serve you as the CEO of the, of the biggest entertainment com company in the world. Um, but I never knew that that's what his roots were. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of interesting, kind of a cute little story mm -hmm. there. Um, but uh, he's welcome to come back to Disney at this point in time. You know what? And we know that there are various different uh, petitions yep. out there to, to have him come back. Um, you know, people are starting to realize that the new regime is, isn't as great uh, with all the other issues and, and whatnot, which kind of leads into uh, our we, next story. We, so. it, you know, it's funny because we it, to me, it's almost like a Robin Hood scenario. Like he was he was King Richard and now we're dealing with with Prince John now. Right, right. Where <laughs> we need a Robin Hood to come to in and come save back, us. Here. Yeah, we really do. Tell us about how other people, because we all know kind of how I feel about this. Right. Stage. And Tell us how other people feel. And we kind of touched on this a little bit when we talked our year-end year right. review. Um, and this was just a story that if we had sat down together, we would have probably written point for point, point for point, the yep. same exact article. So it's kind of interesting, you know, to see that there are other Disney fans that feel the same way about it. So it was basically why people are saying 
they're done with Disney and Disney World might be the magical, the most magical place on Earth, but not everything in the parks and the resorts is perfect according to the fans. So there have been a lot of changes over the years, um, a lot of changes to the parks and the hotels, and some changes have been great while others, um, you know, made planning easier and more convenient. But now other changes that have been happening there are many, many guests that basically have said that they're done. So the big number one, which we talked about, was Disney's Magical Express ending. So this one discontinued at the end of the year. Um, so now with 2022, uh, for anybody that had used Magical Express, that was their shuttle service that would pick you up at Orlando International Airport and drop you off at your resort that you were staying in on Disney property. So now that that's gone, the Mears company, which actually was the one that operated the Magical Express, now is beginning a paid replacement called Mears Connect. And as we had touched on last week, before Magical Express even existed, Mears did that same thing. So basically they're going back to the 90s, the early 90s, when that's what they they did eventually. Um, so... As we mentioned, you were paying for the Magical Express experience as part of your, your package. You just didn't realize, obviously, you were paying for it. And now you really know that you're paying for it because that's the option. Uh, there's that high-speed train that they're, that's under construction. That's probably going to be a, a few years out. Um, but... Then since uh, the article came out, there's actually another bus service that's out there as well. So there's multiple ways to get there. Um, another is the whole Genie Plus system where they remove the fast pass, uh, fast pass system. So fast passes were always a free service that, you know, was any guest of the park was eligible for it. Now you have the whole Genie Plus uh, where you have the 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 free version, which I don't know how well that even works, but then uh, you have the the version where it's fifteen dollars per day per ticket uh, of anybody going to the park. So here's another thing that you have to pay in order to you know get your reservation to to ride on a certain ride. Then now they have the option of the pay per ride. So in addition to having the Genie Plus, now there are certain rides that if you want to skip the line completely, like Rise of the Resistance or Remy's Ratatouille uh, Adventure or Avatar, now you can pay $15, 20 $18 to skip that line. So here's, an, you know, let's add some more money uh, to Disney's pocket to, to skip the line. And then, of course, the whole nickel and diming aspect of it. So having uh, the Genie Plus service, uh, the free magic bands that you used to be able to get if you were a resort guest. Now you have to pay uh, for them. So there are many guests that are not happy about that. Um, then there were perks that they, they took away. So again, the Magical Express, the Magic Bands, package delivery. I didn't even realize that that had been taken away. So you used to, if you were a resort guest and you purchased something in the park, you could, instead of carrying it around with you, you could have it shipped back to your resort. Well, I guess with, you know, uh, maybe, uh, um, not having a, enough cast members in the park, maybe, maybe that, I, I don't know. So that service hasn't been brought back yet. Um, then the early uh, en uh, park entry and the extra magic hours, they cut that back. So for the early entry, it used to be an hour. Now it's only a half hour and it's only certain resorts that you're staying at. So it's not everything. So again, you know, and and then making things much more exclusive. So, you know, things that used to be available for any resort guests now is only available for certain uh, guests of, of Walt Disney World. And then, of course, there's the missing the entertainment. Um, you know, we've talked about how certain shows have kind of started to come back, but there are others that haven't that are still 
missing. Um, so you're really not getting that full experience when you're going uh, to the park. Obviously, health measures are an issue. Uh, the do you have to wear a mask? Do you not have to wear a mask? Are you standing six feet apart? Are we jamming you in a queue line? Um, you know, it, it's almost like every other day something is changing, uh, you know, with that. And then the virtual queues, which are now completely gone. They had the virtual queues set up for Rise of the Resistance they got rid of that. So now the only way to do the ride is either in the, the standby line or to pay the lightning lane. And just uh, this week, Remy's Ratatouille ride, they just got rid of that virtual queue too. So here we put something in place that was awesome, that helped, and now we just got rid of it. Um, and, uh, you know, and then it talks about obviously... The end of, you know, the the biggest thing is that it's just too expensive now, um, you know, that the prices have just gone up over the years so much more so than anything else, you know, around here. So, yeah, we kind of agree with, with you know, yeah, this, with a lot of it. The article itself, I think, was was so well written and touched on so many uh, incredibly poignant mm -hmm aspects of why Disney is really going in the wrong direction. But it's also important to note that a lot of the stuff that they point out in this article is fairly recent decisions mm -hmm. that were made. Right. With, right. You know. And Disney almost wants you to think that a lot of these were a result of the pandemic. And that's incredibly disingenuous on mm -hmm. Disney's part. Right. Because Disney's taking advantage really of a worldwide pandemic that has cost millions of people their lives that that's really not what started this because this nickel and diming stuff started four years ago, five years ago. Right. When they took away the ability to get refilled drinks. Right. And then they took, they started charging for parking. So Disney has been working towards this for some time mm -hmm. now. And the biggest complaint that I've had is nothing that you ever got from Disney without charge was free mm -hmm. because it was all factored into your resort costs, sure, your sure. ticket prices, your prices on anything that you buy. You were paying top dollar for everything that you got there. Even if you stayed at one of the lowest end resorts, you were paying a, a 20 to 30% premium on that room compared to what you would have paid off property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were paying for all these things to begin with. Now Disney is taking all these freebies away, the quote unquote freebies that you're already paying for. And, and some of them they're bringing back that you can pay for. Well, the problem is they're not lowering any of their prices. Right. They're exactly. increasing their mm -hmm. prices. Right. So what you were paying that included these services now no longer includes these services and you need to pay more now. Right. Now, if you said, hey, we're going to discount the rooms now 35% yep. because of all this other stuff that we're adding on – then I could say, okay. Yeah, I'm with you there. Because there are, you know, there's a lot of people who, again, especially with Genie Plus. So before, when you, the old version of the Fast Pass, you took your park ticket, you stuck it in, and you got a hard paper thing, and that was it. And then they changed it over to, you know, the online system. So you had to have your phone out a couple of times a day for it. And, you know, one of the great things that, you know, what one of the hints was to, to save the, the power on your, your phone battery was take screenshots, you right. know, so you have them saved as your photo so that you don't have to be running your phone the entire time. Now you have to, Basically, have your phone on you yeah. twenty four seven. Uh, oh, you know, to and order food. Their back end stuff has to actually be running. And when Amazon right. Web Services goes had down, a problem right. a couple of weeks back, and all your reservations and your fast passes and everything are sitting on a server on Amazon's cloud. Good luck. Now, services you've paid for, mm -hmm, right? Your entire day hinges upon this service now because it's all in the cloud, right? And it's down. Right. Disney didn't lift a finger to to help people with that. They did not offer refunds. They no. didn't do they did nothing. Right. They've they've made people so dependent on a service that they themselves are not providing. Right. 
Right. Why are those servers not physically in Disney's in Disney. property? Right. I'm surprised that they're, you know. So, yeah. So, n now you basically have to use your phone for everything. So, just going and getting a quick service meal, yep. you have to order it online. So, you know, I think the only thing you could probably get is a thing of popcorn or a pretzel without having to order it online. And I've, you know, different... YouTubers that, you know, Disney YouTubers I watched, the one was like, I'm not doing any more Disney videos because, you know, I already felt kind of weird going around videotaping. But now if I have to be on my phone, he goes, I don't even want to do that. If I'm going to go to the park, I'm just going to go to the park. I'm not going to make fast pass reservations. I will stand and wait online and I'll go on two or three rides and then I'll go home. You know, yeah. I'm not even I don't want to be a slave to the my one phone. saving grace about this article is that this was written with feedback from actual customers mm -hmm. that go to Disney. This isn't just a journalist and their opinion here. Right. This is them talking to actual yeah, these customers. these are Disney fans. So what that tells me is that there are people out there that are just as gruntled, disgruntled mm -hmm. as I am. Right. And that's exactly what the real Disney fans need is mm -hmm. they need to speak up. They need right. to contact Disney and most importantly, they need to stop giving Disney their money mm -hmm. because when the the profitability falls off because of all these monumentally bad decisions and it starts to hurt Disney's bottom line, that's the only way you're going to get their attention. Mm -hmm. So that was it for our uh, Disney detective this week. Our Disney bashing our Disney part bashing one this week. Yep. Don't worry, there'll be more. <laughs> Just give us a couple minutes. I think I finally turned you to the dark side. You're making me sell my DVC. I know. Because why have it? I it's know. just another expense that we can't I use. I know. The D the DVC is Disney's way of getting you to spend money so you can go spend money. Right. I know. So that'll be for another week. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll wait later on in the process there. But we'll be right back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So, Star Wars fans are canceling their reservations for the Galactic Star Cruiser. And here's why, even though I didn't push my little Star Wars button. Do, 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 do. Thanks. Thanks. You're pretty good at that. Thanks. Star Wars uh, Galactic Star Cruiser is Disney's brand new one-of-a-kind hotel launching in March 2022. The eagerly awaited Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel will take guests on a simulated two-night voyage through a galaxy far, far away. While aboard the Galactic Star Cruiser, guests will be fully immersed, allegedly, in the Star Wars story as each decision they make will shape the outcome of their journey, supposedly. Recently, Disney fans have been treated to numerous sneak peek looks aboard the Halcyon, but it seems Star Wars fans are not impressed by what they see. Recently, at the Destination D23 event held in Walt Disney World, Chairman of Disney Parks Experiences and Products, Josh DeMaro, revealed his own experience aboard the Galactic Star Cruiser with a sneak peek video while on ABC's The Wonderful World of Disney Magical Holiday Celebration. Disney revealed a first look at entertainment on board the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. The Galactic Star Cruiser has been described as a unique immersive experience 
that Walt Disney Company CEO that you and I both love, Bob Chappick, has promised will leave gas, quote, blown away or poor, depending on your perspective. Characters like Chewbacca, Ray, and Kylo Ren will all be on board, and guests will take a port excursion to Batuu's Black Spire outpost in Disney's Hollywood Studios at Galaxy's Edge. However, Disney has since removed its videos from the Star of the Star Cruiser from its social channels without comment. The original tweet link, as well as the YouTube link, now show that the content has been taken down. Criticism of these videos was high, with many Star Wars fans disappointed in the look of the Halcyon. Most fans agreed the Star Cruiser does not look up to Disney standards of Imagineering and are hoping that the hefty price tag lives up to the expectations in March. Now it seems some of the fans have been canceling their stays aboard the Galactic Star Cruiser, with months that were fully booked having sporadic days available. It's been noted that during the earlier months, the Star Cruiser is open, March, April, and June of 2022, numerous openings have suddenly become available for booking when these months were previously fully booked. Note that a deposit of 20% of the package is due at the time of the booking if your reservation is made more than 91 or more days prior to arrival. This means that your total package which is $6,000 approximately, a deposit of $1,200 is due in order to reserve. If you decide to cancel 90 days or more prior to arrival, a full refund will be given. As we're just weeks from the first launch, it's interesting we're seeing so many cancellations coinciding with the sneak peek videos and cancellation policy deadline. For cancellations 31 to 89 days prior to arrival, you'll get only a 50% refund. And any cancellations within 30 days, no refund will be given. That's a lot of money to give up. Mm -hmm. Social media has been rife with people commenting on disappointment surrounding the Star Cruiser and their desire to cancel. Just a quick reminder, a two-night adventure costs approximately six thousand dollars for an average family of four so i have to say i'm not shocked by this um even seeing the early concept footage you know the concept art that they had of this and you know the rooms it's being treated like a cruise ship so the rooms right. are exceptionally small yeah which is they are star wars themed in their decor but it's not luxurious. Right. $6,000 for two nights, I expect to be living on a cloud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And I want to be in the palace exactly. somewhere. You know, you know yeah. $6,000 for two nights, I should be in the Cinderella suite in the castle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And by all accounts, they were talking about, um, I guess they were sending out these preview packages to people who did reservations. Right. And they were talking about what the itinerary looked like. And your deep, immersive experience consists of 20-minute sessions that aren't even individualized sessions. They're group sessions. Right. And people just were not feeling particularly impressed by all that. Yeah. I, I think part of you was probably in the background going, <laughs> you know, you, you, you were the, you know, little girl giggles, um, you know, at, at – Wow, that that's what they did. And you figure for all the money they put into it, for all the time they took, it could have been so much more. Right. You know, the other thing, too, is and, and you see it when, you know, there were different experiences in the park where they tried to get, you know, uh, guest interaction and things like this. So and, and you wouldn't always get that. So now you're basically saying for two days, you have to role play. You, right. This is a DD and d session, and not everybody knows how to do that. Not everybody right. knows how to just kind of play along with, with a storyline. So you're kind of expecting 
guests to to do that. So not even the rooms or anything like that. That you know, just because that because they're pitching the experience, right? You know that you're not going to be staying in the room. There's no pool there. You know, you're basically not allowed to go and your outside. Excursion is a half day excursion, right? You don't even get a full day in right. the park. You're you're basically getting dropped off at Batu. Galaxy's Edge, you're going on the two rides, you're having a meal, you're probably walking around for another hour or so, and that's and it. And it's a quick service meal, too. Right. It's a quick, because they, not, don't they don't a, have a sit-down They don't restaurant. have a sit-down meal. Now, granted, when you're on the ship, there's the sit-down, right. you, you know, you have your two sit-down meals, there is entertainment, there's a show, well, you know, I'll, kind of I like. I will say, when they had pitched the concept for Galaxy's Edge, they had pitched this idea of it being an immersive experience and you could join the resistance or join the First Order and talk to Ray and do this and do a mission and interact with different characters. And then when it launched, you had, it was no different than characters that walked through any other park. Mm -hmm. They'd come over, you might get a couple of comments from them and then they'd keep going. Mm Mm-hmm. Or you might have a little scene play out in front of you there. It, it you couldn't do that immersiveness, right? They because... never set it. You know, like they they set it up that you could download again to your phone the the data port right, or whatever, right. and it was like, okay, well, you could go over her, here and scan this, and that was like the uh, the little thing you could do around Epcot. That was no different than the little question it, you could do with. But that. the thing at Epcot was even was more interactive, I think, than than the thing at at, at Galaxy's Edge because there was nobody there to help you or to you know at right, least right right they had attendance at, right at, at least Epcot, with yeah. Epcot with the little you know scavenger hunt thing they had yeah. people in. In different places, even with the one that they had at the Magic Kingdom, right? The the different the ones, car, the one with the cards. They yeah. had the one with the cards, and then they also had the one, the pirate one. Oh, right. That was an yeah, Adventureland, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that was yeah. more interactive. But after seeing than, how than much this. they hyped that for right. Galaxy's Edge and how disappointing that was, right? This doesn't shock me at all. Right. This is Disney marketing going crazy overboard. And delivering a tenth of what they're promising. Right. Which seems to be the new philosophy at Disney. Right. And there is absolutely no reason whatsoever that the hotel rooms that are physically on land need to be the size of what a cruise ship would right. be. Especially given the amount of land they have available to right. them. Right. It's not like they didn't have a, enough land. They could have. You're certainly not using it up for a pool or a parking lot because you can't park there either. Right. Because you have to valet park your, your car yep. so that, you, you know, you have the experience of going into the spaceport and, yeah. and everything like that. And then the fact that the rooms are so non Spartan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sparse. <laughs> right. Oh, <laughs> you know. You you can look out your window and see space. No, I can look at a wall that has a TV on it and see space. Right. right. Like, and that, you know, I'll I'll give them that aspect of, you know, okay, that way, that's kind of cool. You know why? That way they don't have to cut the trees down. That's what it right, is. Right, right. Because all the, all the trees are right. right. You don't have all the, the landscaping to hide everything. Right. But yeah, you would expect that the basic room for six thousand dollars would be quite luxurious. Quite luxurious to make up for the fact that yeah, you know. Now this this doesn't surprise me. It it doesn't disappoint me because my expectations were so right. low, and they're surely not getting any money out of me for this fiasco. Right now, I don't think I know anybody that's made a reservation for it. Um, you know, I'm, well, I don't know any one percenters, so no, I don't know anybody who made a, re- a reservation. <laughs> well, with there. with all the the various Disney groups that I'm part of, you know, and and that was the thing because even with DVC, we were like, oh, well, maybe we'll you know see how much it is if we use our points, right. and it was like we didn't even have enough points with everything that we banked or, or to to even cover. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, to, to cover this. Well, and they wouldn't even let you. Right. You can only cover up well, to 50% of it, right? I don't remember, but that, but that was also the thing because at the time all the reservations were gone. I'm sure now if I were to look, 
there's probably yeah. a bunch of reservations. So I'm interested to see what happens because again, it's two months away when the first they're they're guests, gonna have they're gonna know. have the emptiest six thousand dollar hotel. Well, and I have a business. feeling you know the first month it's gonna be VIPs and people that got free tickets. Right, right. they're gonna comp to, all the, to all go. The it's all the comp ones. So them. so we'll see. We'll see uh, how how it comes out. Right. So for the next uh, Star Wars fiasco, I mean Disney fiasco. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the next Star Wars movie that's back in production that had been scrapped and might be back, we think. Uh, Inside the Magic tells us that recently uh, reports have surfaced that the next Star Wars movie, which is Patty Jenkins' Star Wars Rogue Squadron, had been scrapped amid, quote, creative differences and Jenkins' own busy, busy schedule, which includes Wonder Woman 3 and Cleopatra with Gal Gadot. Now, Deadline has reported that the seemingly scrapped movie is officially back on, with Jenkins leaving her directorial debuts in Cleopatra and stepping into a production role. Producing role, sorry. Per the report, Jenkins fell off as director so she could focus on her next two projects, Wonder Woman 3 and Star Wars Rogue Squadron, first announced by Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy at the 2020 Disney Investors Day event. Rogue Squadron was originally slated for December 2023 theatrical release. Given the presumed production delay, it's unknown if Lucasfilm will move up either Marvel president Kevin Feige's or Thor director Taika Waititi Star Wars films and push Jenkins' projects to the 2025 or 27 spot. Previously, Rogue Squadron tapped screenwriter Matthew Robinson but casting details have not been revealed for Rogue Squadron, although Jenkins has shared it will be, quote, fe uh, uh, it will feature new characters. Uh, this should be of particular interest to those who enjoy Star Wars Legends materials, or like we used to call it, Expanded Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that Rogue Squadron, although not a direct interpretation of the 1998 Rogue Squadron video game and the novel series that began with X-Wing Rogue Squadron, will draw heavy inspiration from the Star Wars Expanded Universe projects. Jenkins' official Rogue Squadron announcement on Twitter last year included a video of the director at an airfield. Jenkins herself, the daughter of a a uh, fighter pilot father, is hoping to make, quote, the greatest fighter pilot movie ever made. Which, you know, if you compare it to Lucas's Red Tails, you, you don't have a very high bar you have to get over on that mm. one. Jenkins also told The Hollywood Reporter, we're finishing a script, crewing up, and it's all going wonderful. I'm so excited about the story and excited that we're the next chapter of Star Wars which is such a responsibility and such an opportunity to really start some new things. It's really exciting in that way. So she's very excited about this. As she mentioned, How excited is she? She's so excited that we're <laughs> going to turn her excitement into a drinking game. Every time Patty Jenkins is interviewed and says she's excited, drink. Nice. Um, yeah. Th th Disney really has a hard time with, with directors when it comes to their Star Wars movies. Yep. Um. I hope this is good. I like the concept of this. This is definitely a really cool story to tell. I was a big fan of the Rogue Squadron novels. Mm -hmm. uh, big fan of the of the video game as well. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is kind of cautiously optimistic on this one. Understandable. Um, but I think they got a lot of a lot of Star Wars irons in the fire at this point mm -hmm. in time. Yep. Uh, between all the TV series, all yeah. the movies, uh, the one really positive thing that that this announcement tells me is nobody's talking about Ryan Johnson <laughs> getting another movie. I was just gonna say, hey, what's Ryan up to? Let's give it to to Kevin Feige, to Taika, right. to Patty Let Jenkins. Let everybody else do it. Give but it, him. give it. To, I would give a movie to Jar Jar at this point in time if it kept it out of the hands of Ryan Johnson. Nice. So okay. we'll, we'll see. I'm curious how this is going to affect the timeline. Sure. But I think that was all we had for our uh, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy this week. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. In 
Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment. (laughs) So uh, Taylor Swift's re-release of her hit song, All Too Well, has now broken the record for the longest song to take the top spot on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. And Swift has handed the win with grace so the songstress sent flowers to don mclean whose song american pie had first set the record when it hit number one in 1972 with a runtime of around eight minutes and 37 seconds so the new version of all too well a part of swift's re-release of her 2012 album red clocks in at just over 10 minutes What a class act, McLean said of Swift in an Instagram post thanking the artist for the flowers. In a note, McLean, Swift wrote about the singer's impact on her music. She said, I will never forget that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Your music has been so important to me, sending love from one writer of long songs to another. So last month, McLean spoke about losing the top spot in a statement expressing zero regret after holding the record for almost 50 years. There is something to be said for a great song that has staying power, he said. American Pie remained in the top for 50 years, and now uh, Taylor Swift has unseated such a historic piece of artistry. Let's face it, nobody ever wants to lose that number one spot, but if I had to lose it to someone, I am sure glad it was another great songwriter, singer, such as Taylor. This record isn't the only one that Swift has broken following the release of Red. Uh, With the album, she also set the record for the most simultaneous U.S. Hot 100 entries by a woman, with 26 songs from the album making the Hot 100 chart. The record was previously 18 songs, which was set... uh, Sorry, the record was previously 18 songs, which actually she had set in 2019 with the album Lover. The Grammy Award-winning singer dropped Red, Taylor's version, last month. Uh, A recording of her acclaimed 2012 album Red, known for its hits like I Knew You Were Trouble and We Were Never Getting Back Together. The re-release is part of Swift's effort to regain ownership of her early catalog after record uh, executives and her music manager, Scooter Braun, gained control of her first six albums master recordings in 2019 by an acquisition deal. So, yeah, I think this is a class act here. I also think Mm -hmm. uh, Don McLean's uh, reaction to this um, was a bit of chest pounding at at the same time that he was complimenting her. Mm. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, she's a real class act here, but. I had it for 50 years. I I was the best so far. You know, it's like, okay. (laughs) How many other songs did you do? Right, exactly. I'm surprised, like, Meatloaf didn't have a song longer than. (laughs) I don't think Meatloaf songs qualify as as songs. (laughs) They're operatic. They're they're operas, right. They're they're operatic (laughs) mini uh, Broadway musicals. They're like miniseries. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of funny that you know, 50 years it was still the longest song with again all these other songs that and just of kind course, of thanks to our daughter every time it comes on the radio, 
We don't get to listen to Don McLean's version anymore. We have to listen <laughs> to, to the Weird Al version. The Weird Al, because she'll sing it over top of it. Right, right. The only time you get to hear it is those those two verses in the middle there that Weird Al didn't actually do. Right, right. So <laughs> thank you, uh, Madison, for that. Right, right. Uh, so some, some, you know, I don't think this would be an entertainment podcast if we didn't have some thoughts on the passing of Betty White. Yeah, that was – uh, a, I think, shock yeah. to, to everybody. We happened to be at the mall yep. uh, that day, and you know we were just kind of getting out of the house, walking around, and you just said, oh my God, Betty White just passed away. I'm like, what? Get out of here. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's... I think it, I think everybody kind of took it, and I, I don't mean to, to, to well up, but it, it's kind of like everybody's grandmother. Yeah. And, and really, that you was know? a role. And it's funny that is a role that she slipped into in the 1970s, right? And she embraced it, right? She was she was like so many because uh, she started out in modeling, so right. she's always been a, a gorgeous woman, mm-hmm. and so many people that their careers are centered around their beauty, Mm -hmm. have a very difficult time aging out of that. Right, right. And Betty White embraced it. She was beautiful, you know, up until her passing. Mm -hmm. But she was, her beauty truly ran beyond skin deep. Mm -hmm. And she internally was a beautiful person. And that, she exuded that. Um, But she accepted that grandmotherly role for the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But yet was still <laughs> raunchy <laughs> yeah. in, in other respects. And, you know, when the, the, her whole thing with, with Ryan Reynolds, where, you know, he's like, oh, I know she has a crush on me. And she, you know, no. And just recently it was like, now, if Robert Redford were to call me up, <laughs> I would totally, you know, he's he's on my bucket list, yeah. you know, type thing. And this is not what you would expect from a 99 year yeah. old woman but that was she still had it you know yeah, and she, and she was so funny always so funny I, I had read on the day of her passing there was an article on cnn and she had talked about her early career because she started in tv before tv was a thing right right she was on an, an very early t- local tv broadcast in in uh, i think it was california at the right time, right when she was 16 years old mm-hmm. now this is this is before you have TV networks and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's how long she's been doing television. Right. And she said, you know, at the time in, you know, 40s, 50s and, and into the 60s, women weren't supposed to be funny. Mm-hmm. Women were supposed to be pretty, be seen, not heard, and they were just a set piece almost. And she broke that mold and mm-hmm. she set she broke. She set so many standards mm-hmm. for women in entertainment moving forward. Absolutely, and, and just the the force of will it took to do that, mm-hmm. and the bravery to do that. She had her own. She was the only first female talk show host in the nineteen fifties. Mm-hmm. It, it's just incredible the things that she did. Right, and she ended up getting canceled because she featured a black dancer, and. The Southern affiliates, you know, in the South were complaining about it. And what did she do? She put him on more. She highlighted him more and didn't give a damn what they had to say. And eventually they pulled their sponsorship yeah. and the show got canceled. But she stood her she ground. Didn't she didn't her principles. Yeah. You know, and I then mean, years later, she got another version of her talk show. She had, you know, three different versions of it. We I operate in an age today where role models that, that I as a parent are far and few between that I want my daughter to look up to. Mm-hmm. And for 99 years, mm-hmm. Betty White has been that type of role model. Mm-hmm. She was brave. She was strong. She was brilliant. She was funny. She mm-hmm. was talented. She she happened to be beautiful, too. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't, that was how she started her career, but that wasn't what she leaned on. Right. She had so many talents mm-hmm. that made her career what it was. Yeah. Truly a, a legend. 
to to lose and and just a few weeks before her 100th birthday yeah so of course a lot of what people are saying is honor her legacy 5 10 15 20 bucks whatever you can to a local animal shelter or a local zoo in her honor because that's what she would want everybody to to do so what was the quote about uh, lose the it was too soon right it was um you know you know while she she at 99 she she, uh she died too too soon right you know when 99 is too young to to go yeah yeah you know there there were multiple people that had a variation of of that quote right um you know that you know it's pretty bad when you know you're 99 years old and and you went too soon yeah yeah we did have another groundbreaking female uh, comedian. Yeah, so um, so obviously Betty White has a legacy that will live on, and not just through the films and television shows that she starred in, but through the memories of those who knew her best. And one such figure is Vicki Lawrence, White's longtime friend and co-star on The Carol Burnett Show and Mama's Family and Eunice. Um, I do have some lovely stories of Betty, Lawrence had said during an exclusive chat uh, on E! News Daily Pop, going on to reminisce about everything from the late actress's love of animals, where she said Betty could pick up a snake and hand it to you. Isn't this beautiful? To a dinner party that she would throw in the pair's early Mama Days family, including one particular event. Betty invited us to her house for a lovely home-cooked meal and game night of fun. Lots of laughs, Lawrence had said. Al and I hadn't been married that long, just a few years, and we're driving home, and Al finally says, I hope you don't take this wrong, but if anything ever happens to you, I would date Betty White. And she continued, well, sweetie, I'll tell you what, if anything ever happened to you, I would even start dating Betty White. (laughs) So, uh... That we both agreed on and that we both absolutely adored her. And all these generations have uh, have just come to love her over and over and over again. And now that fans are mourning her passing, uh, that she passed away at 99 on uh, December 31st, Lawrence wants to remind them that this Golden Girl alum would not want us to be sad. Um, I know what she would say. Oh, sweetie, don't be sad for me. I had a blast. I had a great time. Uh, you need to laugh and carry on. I honestly believe that this is what she would say. After being in touch with Carol Burnett, the actress also revealed uh, what White's apparently uh, did say just before passing, and it was her late husband's name. Um, Carol had texted uh, me back and she said that she had spoke to Betty's assistant who was with her when she died Lawrence had explained and her assistant said that the last word out of her mouth was Alan um, how sweet and loving is that um, she said it's so sweet and it's so loving and God I sure hope it's true Lawrence added Met had actually met Alan London uh, he was the then host of Password when she was a guest on the game show in 1961. Uh, He was married at the time, but his wife had passed away of cancer soon after. And a year later, White and London were cast in the same play. And by 1963, they were married. London had died of cancer in 1981, and she never remarried. Um, White, meanwhile, died peacefully in her sleep at her home, according to her longtime friend and agent. Um, when he had spoken to NBC News, he wanted to clear up rumors because, of course, one of the things that popped up was, oh, she had just gotten her booster and it, he said no. And it has been, it's come out since then that she did die of natural causes. So, you know, it, it's nice to, you know, I'm sure it's, it's going to be one of those urban legends that, you know, her last word, uh, yeah. you know, was Alan, but. Well, and she made no no uh, secret of the love that the two of them shared. Oh, absolutely! In one of the interviews that that she was talking about it, she talked about how they had courted. He had mm-hmm. tried courting her for a year, and he right. would buy her gifts and 
you know, make arrangements to sort of bump into her and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And today it would be kind of stalkery type right, stuff. Right, right, right. And yeah. she said finally after a year she just couldn't – she couldn't not give in to it mm-hmm. anymore. And later on when he had passed uh, – after he had passed, she said she had wished she hadn't wasted that year. Yeah. So anyway, I think that's all we had for – Entertainment news. Yep. So go in and donate to, you know, so, some animal shelter. And know? that was from her father, by the way. Her father oh, okay. had a love of animals. Okay. And she, and she, you know. And she took that off from her father. Yeah. So, so good go, for her. So go feed some animals. Uh, we'll be right back with our insightful picks. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick happens to be a show that we both uh, enjoy very much. Uh, and it is a reboot-ish, I, uh, I guess. Uh, it's on CBS and it is Ghosts. Uh, Samantha is a cheerful freelance journalist and Jay, her husband, is an up-and-coming chef from the city. And they both throw caution and money to the wind when they decide to convert a huge rundown country estate that they inherited into a bed and breakfast, only to find that it's inhabited by many spirits of deceased residents. The departed souls are so close-knit, a very... uh, um, eccentric group that includes a saucy prohibition era lounge singer, a pompous 1700s uh, militia man, a 60s hippie uh, who is fond of hallucinogenics, and an overly upbeat 1980s scout troop leader. Uh, if the spirits are anxious about the commotion a- of the renovation of the B&B, it's nothing compared to when they realize that Samantha is the first live person who can see and hear them. Um, so this show uh, was originally a British version. There's a British version, uh, kind of the same concept, uh, where two people uh, move into a house and something happens and the one person can can hear the various ghosts and see them. So this is the the U.S. version, and that's happened to a bunch of different uh, shows that w- that we've watched and we've liked and watched both versions. So uh, this one, we you know from the beginning, we have been laughing nonstop. It's a thirty minute sitcom. Um, it's interesting because each show they try and focus on the different ghost and and how that ghost happened to uh, end up in this estate. Uh, you know, some people were actually relatives that live there. Some people happened to be, uh, you know, passing through and something happened. Um, so what ends up happening is in the first episode, an accident happens. Uh, Samantha bumps her head and now she can see all the ghosts. And now it, it's funny, um, you know, because she's translating for the ghosts and, and you know, the, the ghosts haven't eaten, but they enjoy the, the smell of the cooking. <laughs> so they'll they'll request certain meals to be cooked just so that they can they can smell them. So, uh, you know, we've, we've watched, you know, I think there's actually two episodes we haven't, uh, caught up on. Um, but very funny show. It has been renewed, uh, for, for a second season. So, uh, you know, something fun and, and light to, to watch. So good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is The Book of Boba Fett on Disney+. Plus. The legendary bounty hunter Boba Fett navigates the underworld of the galaxy with mercenary Fennec Shan when they return to the sands of Tatooine to stake their claim on the territory formerly ruled by the deceased crime lord Jabba the Hutt. So, okay, here we go. <laughs> After seeing the post credit scene in the season two finale of The Mandalorian that featured Boba Fett essentially taking over his former employer Jabba the Hutt's operations after he assassinated Jabba's major domo, Bib Fortuna, I was kind of left scratching my head. We last saw Boba Fett in live action as he was consumed by the Sarlacc in Return of the Jedi, presumed dead. The first of many great villains wasted by George Lucas before their time. End of story, right? Well, not really. 
not with Disney helming the franchise, who's notorious for milking every last penny out of its properties. Boba Fett, much like Darth Vader and Darth Maul, were crowd favorites, which to Disney translates into dollars. These money makers can't be dead, so how can we resurrect them? Well, that seems to be part of the big focus of the book of Boba Fett. The puzzling thing is that we see him presumably after his buddy cop style team up with the Mandalorian's Din Djarin. So this has to be after Return of the Jedi, which means he survived his dinner party with the ravenous Sarlacc. But while it's nice to see an older, plumper, and more weathered version of Boba Fett, do we really need to? We could be, uh, what could he possibly bring to the story that's going to be really of interest to us? What do we get from episode one is a bit of a snooze fest, quite disappointingly. We get a lot of flashbacks. In fact, the entire episode is almost a flashback. We get some backstory on how he survived being digested over a thousand generations, which turned out to only be about five minutes. Um... With kind of a really weak explanation, we learn how he wound up with the Tuscans, and we get a little local political drama with his new job, which is almost as interesting as, you know, trade lanes and stuff like that that worked out so well in episode one. Still, I was left feeling, feeling a little let down. So we watched episode two, and after watching episode two, I don't feel all that much better about the show. We get more backstory, which I'm not sure how you could spend two episodes giving me how he crawls his way out of a sarlacc, but okay. We get more political drama, which still isn't interesting at all. We get a badass-looking walking carpet, which was nice. You get to see a new Wookiee. Uh, we get a mean Tuscan dance, especially if you drop the volume on the show and fire off some Earth, Wind, and Fire September, which the scene seems perfectly timed for, <laughs> thanks to my wife. Uh, you You're get, welcome. <laughs> you get a little bit of light action, but other than that, there's really no compelling reason for the show to exist. Maybe I've been left permanently jaded towards Star Wars thanks to Ryan Johnson's abominable Last Jedi. I don't think so, because I have a deep appreciation for The Mandalorian, not to mention the fact that Vader's OP scene at the end of Rogue One actually has me looking forward to forthcoming shows that tease the return of my favorite villain. George Lucas and the Clone Wars did little to sully, I'm sorry, did a lot to sully the image of Boba Fett, who, like Han Solo, has such a perfectly written character from day one because they were so little written, and all, all you had were first impressions. I don't think Boba Fett needs a series. I don't think his image can be redeemed from the damage of the Clone Wars, a whiny little kid who pushes people around. And I think any attempt to do so is a bit of revisionist history. I'm hoping that Filoni and Favreau uh, hit another home run here. They need to make me care about these characters. They need to make this show matter in some way that Star Wars has struggled under the gluttonous control of Disney. I want to like this show. I really do because he's. I love the character. And I'll say it again. I'm cautiously optimistic. That's about as... as upbeat as I get, but it's a short series and the clock is ticking. Uh, I, I have to watch it because it's Star Wars. I only hope I'm rewarded for it in the end. If it's anything like the Marvel series, you got to get five episodes in before they get interesting. So cautiously optimistic is the best I can do. So that's all I got. We'll be right back with our afterthoughts. So what do we have for afterthoughts? So uh, ZoloCon, which... ZoloCon! You gotta let me do it. So first up... ZoloCon. Do you feel better now? I'm much better. Thank okay. You. Uh, so ZoloCon uh, last year was done during the summer, because normally it's done February, March right. time frame. Uh, normally so there's they, snow on the ground. There's no, normally slow on the ground. This time it wasn't. Uh, so this year it is back to, to March time frame. And I so missed it last time. You did because you weren't feeling well. Not so missing it this time. Hopefully not missing it this time. So it is uh, March 5th, Saturday, March 5th, and Sunday, March 6th. 
uh, one of our f- most favorite venues, uh, which is the Fugue, uh, which is in Warminster, Pennsylvania, uh, f- uh, 10 to 6 on the first day and uh, 9 to 4.30 on the second day. So you can uh, look at Zolocon.com for more information. Uh, then a month later, we have the Delaware Train Show on Saturday, April 2nd, and then the April Fool's Toy Show, which I is... pity the fool. Right. Sunday, <laughs> April 3rd. And that uh, will take you to Newcastle, Delaware, to the Nur Shrine Center. Uh, that's a, a nice little show. Uh, usually we end up finding some... It's great for some, antiques and collectibles yeah, if you're into yeah, some of the old stuff. Yeah, you're... There, you know, they have a couple of vendors that have newer things but you know the majority of the stuff is is the classic uh stuff there and then finally fan expo which is formerly known as wizard world will be finally coming back to the philadelphia convention center uh april 8th through the 10th awesome uh that was all we had for our answer thoughts Mm mm-hmm uh, before we go, I do want to bother you once again to invite you to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions can be found listed as insights into entertainment. Video versions can be found listed as insights into things. Pretty much anywhere you get a podcast. Blah, 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 blah. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, we did ask you to, uh, what was the next thing? Email oh, us. Email us. Contact us. Give us your uh, conventions and shows you'd want us to plug. Tell us if we're doing a good job. Tell us if we're doing a bad job. We were open to constructive criticism. Sure. As long as it's constructive. Right. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at Facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at Instagram.com backslash insights into things. Or you can get links to all that stuff and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.